guys, welcome to the Homestead. So today we're going to do another Q&A roundup, email roundup of questions that you guys have sent in through my website and AmericanHomestead.com through our contact page. And so a lot of different questions, some good questions today. Uh, these are questions normally, I try to pick questions that I get on a pretty regular basis. That way I can get the most bang for my buck. So um, with that said, let's go ahead and get into the first question. Hey Zach, will you be at the Baker Creek Spring Planting Festival this year? <laughs> Uh, no, there's no way, no way I will ever go back to that place again. Um, so, um, if you haven't noticed, I don't like that company. I don't like that company. I just, you know, when the whole thing happened in 2020, they made it very clear where they are, where they, what they believe in. That is a liberal company run by liberal owner and, um, they support the, I'm, I'm done with them. They made it very clear where they stand. I will never be a customer or participate in any of the things that they, you know, it would be one thing if they would have come out and said, you know what? We were wrong. We were wrong about this. We, we shouldn't have done. We shouldn't have taken the position we did. Um, but it was very clear. They said, no, no, we never, we never believed this way. And we don't believe that. And, but it was clear from internal memoing that employees at that company sent me that, that they do believe in that. And there's other indicators also, I won't get into that, that this, the owner of that company is very, very liberal. So I'm not, I'm not going to participate in that. And I know others who are not going to be doing that as well. So I will not be. There are other homesteading um, uh, festivals and, and conferences that I've been invited to, amazingly. Uh, there's a couple this year I'm going to be going to and speaking at. And so uh, stay tuned on the channel for that. And I'll let you know where I'll be if you guys want to come see me uh, for that. And we'll have some T-shirts to sell, too, also, and some other things. So... Uh, just stay tuned for that. Uh, next question. I'm not a gun owner, but recently there have been several local break-ins and even a kidnapping where I live. Oh, good grief. Leaving is not an option, but I need to protect myself. I'm a woman who needs a gun. Where can I start? With the increase in crime, this is becoming more and more apparent to people who never thought they'd own a gun that yes, they would to, to defend themselves and their families, they want to get a gun. They want to get some experience, some training, and they want to get a firearm that they can use to protect themselves. Um, so this is something that we get a lot. I get a lot and I'm not a firearms channel. There are plenty of other firearms channels out there, but however, if you're here and you want to know what I would recommend, especially for a woman, um, and, and there are a lot of gun ranges, a lot of, um, ranges where you can go with gun shops that have ranges attached to them that will have rentals available for you to try. See, it's easy for me to say, oh yeah, go out and get this gun or go out and get that gun. that will be great. Get that one. But the reality is until you shoot it, until you find something that you yourself are comfortable with, because everyone has different size hands, everyone has different uh, abilities. And so until you find something that works for you, it's hard for me or anyone to say, this is going to be what you need. Um, I can tell you uh, as a, as a woman, my, my late wife, Jamie, she had, her first gun was a 38 special Rossi. It was a six shot Rossi 38 special and she really liked that gun. And then eventually she graduated up, up to uh, a, a Springfield Armory subcompact, the XD subcompact, and she really liked that one. It's just going to depend, you know, again, where you are and what you like. She tried a number of different guns before she found one she liked. So um, most of these ranges that are out there that have gun shops attached to them or gun shops that have ranges attached to them, they are used to dealing with new and inexperienced shooters. So going in there and not knowing anything, this is don't think you're, they're going to be like, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> no, they are very accustomed to dealing with new shooters, people who have never bought a gun before. And so you going in there, a complete noob, they're going to be fine with that and they're going to try to direct you Hopefully, they're going to have the – they usually will have the right attitude to deal with someone who's new, okay? From the experience that I have had with numerous gun shops and knowing lots of owners of gun shops, they are there to help new – they love helping new people because they want to get you into the culture. Because what happens is once you buy a gun, you're now a gun owner who votes because there are people out there who want to take the thing that you just bought away from you. The, the ability for you to defend yourself and your family – because the reality is when it's 2 a.m. and there's someone banging down your door, it's a little too late to go get a gun. And you have, to, if you have children to think about and yourself to protect, if you're a single person living by yourself or whatever, you know, it's too late. If you're a disabled person living by yourself, it's too late. You need something to defend yourself right then and there. And so um, 
Go out, rent a few pistols at these gun shops, try a few different things, and then see what you feel most comfortable with, and then get some training. Take a class. They have basic beginner pistol classes usually at these gun ranges too. They have uh, women's classes. A lot of times these places will be having classes that are just specifically for women. And so um, that way you don't have to feel weird about shooting with other men. Um, they try to make it feel, they try to make it really comfortable for someone who's new and who's a woman. So that would be my, my best uh, piece of advice to get you, to give you is to go ahead and just see what's out there and then try some rentals at some of these places. Okay, there you go. Zach, how is your spelt experiment doing? We haven't seen an update this spring yet. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused on how this is going to work. Um, I want to take you out there and show you what I got, but this was a, something I just wanted to see if I could grow spelt. And spelt is usually planted in the fall, and then it's harvested in the spring, and usually about now. And it, something weird is happening out there. So let's go outside and take a look. Well, here is my field of spelt. This is it. My experiment and um, it's growing, but there are no heads that I have seen yet. I mean, there's just no heads here. So I have yet to see a head growing up on any of these spelt plants in this field. And it's already the end of April, and I just don't know if we're going to get... <laughs> any spelt and because it's almost May usually around the beginning of May and, and mid-May is when I take this field and I plant sorghum here so because I don't see any heads yet growing up um, I don't know if I'm gonna just I may just let my sheep come over here and just eat it down I'm sure they'd love to get in here and eat all this but um, I really want to make sure I grow sorghum because of the grain we use for our chickens and for the sugar content. So I'm not sure if this experiment is gonna fail unless these heads pop up here shortly and I don't see any heads coming up. Leave a comment below if you have any idea what went wrong, but I just don't see any spelt heads. Lots of, lots of spelt leaves, plants, but no spelt heads. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, if I don't get anything coming up here really soon, I'm gonna just plow this over and I'm gonna plant my uh, my sorghum grain so I can get sugar and, and grain for the chicken feed for this year. And I'll just let the sheep mow it down first and then I'll, I'll plow it under because they would love to get in here. And uh, I'm surprised they haven't broken down the fences yet already <laughs> to come to get in here. So we'll see. Oh look, here's one. Here's one right here. But that's like the only one I've seen. So I don't know. That's weird. That's just weird. This, this plant looks completely different, actually, compared to all these other ones. But this is the only grain head that I have seen thus far. If you have any ideas of why this did not work, let me know. But yeah, well, there we go. So I'm experimenting with a number of different things to grow food, different food items that I can utilize. Grains, I'm gonna be trying to grow some rice this year in a pond that's kind of a shallow pond. I'm gonna see if I can grow some rice around the edges of that. Um, I'm just trying different things to be able to expand my production here. Again, this is all about being a producer. In a world where inflation is running rampant and there might be shortages of this and that going here, going forward, I think it's a good idea to be able to produce something, no matter what, produce something. And so I'm I'm trying to maximize my production abilities here on the homestead and that means trying new things along going with some of the things that I know I can do already and then adding to that and just seeing what works and you know if something works then I may try it again and then you know I may go with it it just depends but always experiment always try new things all right last question can I grow avocados or citrus like lemons without a greenhouse Believe it or not, this is a question I get a lot. Can I grow lemons here or citrus or people in Missouri or in the Ozarks or other places throughout the country? You know, what is the experience, experience on growing citrus or avocados, things that wouldn't normally grow where you might live? Can it work in a greenhouse? Yes, my answer is yes, however. <laughs> in life, there is always however. Um, Usually when you have a greenhouse like that in the winter time, you're going to need some sort of energy, uh, some sort of energy to be able to keep that place warm 
in the colder growing regions. And I know there's different methods you can have when you build a greenhouse. You can make it two layer and all this stuff and different. But again, if you are looking for an off grid scenario, it's going to be tough. If you have access to power and you know you're going to have access to power always, then yeah, go ahead and try to grow citrus. You might be able to do it. There are people who have been successful. Banana trees are another one. I tried a cold hardy banana tree here and I tried it uh, two times and both times failed. I'm not going to try it again. So, um, and it was a, it was a cold hardy banana tree that would produce fruit. It just didn't work. So I, you know, again, I experiment and I try things that work and I try things to see if they work. And if they don't, I may try it a second time. And if it doesn't, then I'm going to go on and I, I have limited amounts of time. So I'm going to try to put in the most effort on things that I know will work while at the same time trying experiments here and there. Citrus where I live, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a greenhouse with unlimited power supplies, uh, you know, you have that ability for to have that energy coming in all the time and you're not worried about it inter being interrupted at any point in time down the road in the future, um, you can make it happen. However, for me, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, I can, there are plenty of other places to get vitamin C. There are plants that get vitamin C out here. Uh, you, you know, if you really need vitamin C in, in order to avoid scurvy, or things like that. You have pine needles you could boil and drink that tea. Um, you have uh, stinging nettle. We mentioned stinging nettle the other day in the in the, um, in the video. And stinging nettle uh, is a is a source of vitamin C. It's a very healthy and medicinal plant and nutritious plant. Uh, I would highly recommend growing it. I, and and that's what we're doing here. Also, I have a packet someone gave me a year or so ago, and I already have it growing out there. But I planted some more of stinging nettle. So. Um, there are ways, other ways to get vitamin C if you need it. So maybe educate yourself on those ways and then go with that. So anyway, hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Go ahead. If you have questions, be sure to send them in at anamericanhomestead.com on our contact page. And I'll try to put together a video if it's a question that I feel passionate about the answer to or if it's something that I get on a regular basis, I may put it in a video. I love hearing your questions. And leave, please leave a comment below. Let us know your exper experience. Let me know your experience and what you think went wrong on the spelt. Let me know your experience and what you think might be able to grow, how someone might be able to grow citrus in an off-grid. Is that possible, you know, environment? I don't know. Uh, but leave your experience below. I'd love to hear. And other people might benefit as well from the education that you and wisdom that you already have based on your experience. All right, guys. See you next time in the homestead. Bye. This is Grandma. Grandma survived the Great Depression. She survived the Great Depression because her supply chain was local and she knew how to do stuff. Grandma was smart. Grandma told us to make do with what you got. She also said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Homesteading is all about self-reliance and declaring ourselves to be independent from the system. We grow our own food, we raise our own animals, and doing these things help safeguard our families from the unpredictable world that surrounds us. But what about banking? I love being my own power company, but what about being my own bank? Right now, our country is over $30 trillion in debt and rising. The Fed keeps printing money and the Congress won't stop spending money. Staying attached to the modern banking system and their investment vehicles is like putting all of your eggs in one very, very fragile basket. On one side, you have the threat of inflation and your savings value floating away. And the other side is a possible deflationary stock market collapse, just like what happened in the 1930s. Genesis Gold Group is like a basket holding eggs and these eggs are impossible to break. History shows us that all paper investments have and will return to their intrinsic value eventually. Zero. But gold, silver, and other precious metals have never, ever been worthless. In every collapse throughout history, people have turned back to precious metals to find monetary value. If you have a 401k, an IRA, or a savings account where you're literally watching the purchasing power inflate away, give Genesis Gold Group a call right now. Today. This instant. They can develop a strategy for you in the days ahead. I can tell you how I raise sheep, I can tell you how I raise chickens, or the best way to grow tomatoes, or how to hook up a solar panel. But Genesis Gold Group is your best shot at safeguarding your hard-earned savings and investments during this increasingly turbulent time in history. The link and phone number is in the description below, or visit their website at genesisgoldgroup.com. And be sure to say you heard about them from an American homestead.